Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Loon University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a while since we've done a real academic deep dive into some theoretical concepts. So if you like those episodes, you're going to be in for a treat with this one. My guest is Dr. Jean-Christophe Plantin. He's an associate professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics. And Dr. Plantin's research looks at the increasing infrastructural role that digital platforms play in society. So if we think about the so-called tech giants, right, Amazon, Facebook, Google, how do we think and consider conceptualize about what these entities are. On the one hand, there is a line of research that argues that these are platforms. And when we think of platforms, we think about things like programmable services, right, with APIs that share data and developers can work to incorporate new services within the central platform. But then there's also a way to look at these entities as infrastructures. And infrastructure studies is an approach that looks at everything from, you know, socio-technical systems to power grids and how these networks, these different sets of networks come together to be increasingly valuable for society. So one way to think about it is you as a user, uh, for an infrastructure, you have to opt out because it's so important that to sort of go off the power grid is an active choice. Whereas platforms are more opt-in, where you actively choose to use this service. Now, what's interesting is that what Dr. Planta notes in his research is that these two concepts are increasingly becoming blended when we think about the so-called tech giants. They're acting both as platforms and infrastructures at the same time, and they do so through the services they provide, but also the way that they are changing the industry of data and networks through things like fiber optics and underwater sea cables. So I really like this type of research because it forces us to step back from, okay, what is this Senate hearing saying, or how many fake accounts did Facebook remove today, and conceptually think about what are these tech giants? How do we think about them in the broader scope of society and politics? So in this episode, Dr. Plantin will share how he's been conceptualizing this hybridization between platforms and infrastructures through a lens that he calls media infrastructures. And we'll talk about what media infrastructures are and also unpack these arguments about how platforms are becoming more like infrastructures and vice versa. So we'll touch upon a couple different studies that Dr. Plantin has wrote with his co-authors. One is called Infrastructure Studies Meet Platform Studies in the Age of Google and Facebook. And we'll also get a bit into WeChat and its development in China through an article that Dr. Plantin has written entitled WeChat as Infrastructure, the Techno-Nationalist Shaping of Chinese Digital Platforms. So there'll be links to those down in the show notes, as well as a link to an online lecture that Dr. Planton gave recently on his ongoing work about programmable infrastructures. And this is the idea that the material hardware that makes up infrastructural networks, things like C cables and servers and switches, are increasingly being disaggregated and decentralized in a way that's following more of a programmable platform logic. And what does that mean for the power of tech giants moving forward? So I love this type of approach. I think it's super interesting to think about some of these infrastructural aspects that are often left out of the social media research looking particularly at election to election. So I wanted to put it on the pod and I hope you all enjoy it as well. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Jean-Christophe Plantin. Again, he's an associate professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the LSE. Dr. Plantin, thanks so much for taking the time out and welcome to the Social Media and Politics podcast. Thanks, Michael, for having me. Really happy to be here. 
So to start out here, why don't we break down a few of the key concepts that you've been developing in your research? And the first one I'd like to discuss is media infrastructures, which draws attention to this interplay between digital platforms, which is kind of the services that we're all familiar with, and the physical infrastructures that make those platforms work. And I think maybe we're not all familiar with those. So could you outline the concept of media infrastructures for us and why we should even be thinking about media infrastructures in the first place? Absolutely. Um, yeah, if you allow me to be a little idiosyncratic and just to tell me a little bit on how I came to this concept, maybe that would that would be helpful. Just because, yeah, this is a history that I guess we'll be telling on how we can put these different concepts together. My background is in uh, media communication studies, and I worked a lot since my PhD on the concept of platform. I worked a lot. I studied participatory mapping, Google Maps, OpenStreetMap. And we are here, yeah, mid-2000s is still the Web 2.0 kicking pretty strong. And the type of scholarship at the time emphasizes the participatory nature of these platforms, allowing people to post more easily, to create, to uh, engage in activism or creative practices. So that was my standpoint. That's what I really started with. Um, I did a postdoc, postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan. And with my colleagues there, I became much more and more familiar with the concept of infrastructure. I worked a lot with Paul Edwards, Carl Lagozzi, and Christian Senvig. And these folks are much more on the STS side of these topics, of the study of technology. And they were, of course, talking a lot about infrastructure. And they were talking about large distributed systems that are put together via standards and gateways and these type of things. But what was super interesting when we started working together and focusing more on the Facebook and Googles of the world is that what I was describing as platform, they were describing as infrastructure. Do you see what I mean? At some point, we realized that we were talking about more or less the same thing using different concepts. So that made us pause and that led us to write a paper together just to try to clarify what we meant by these two concepts. And the key point of our paper that we co-wrote is that it's probably relevant right now when we want to study tech giants generally, to consider them as both a platform and an infrastructure. And it is this very, um, this intermingling, really, this hybridization that is interesting. We tried several concepts that were just terrible, like platformized infrastructure or blah, 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 but that's just terrible. So we decided to branch out on the concept of media infrastructure that exists already in our field. Lisa Parks, Nikos Serozielski have been doing fantastic work around that concept, bringing the concepts and the perspective of infrastructure closer to, um, to media and communication. So that's... That's the genesis of that concept. Right. And as you mentioned, there's kind of a platform component to that and an infrastructure component to that that really um, sort of work together. So I'd like to take each part first and ask you, you know, what are the key components of a platform as traditionally understood? Yeah, absolutely. You're right that it it usually makes a lot of sense to first start by what is what and what does each side really mean before trying to put them together. Platform is a, um, if we look at through the lens of social science, of course, if we put computing and engineering on the side, which is related, different, but also has its set of definitions to it. If we stick to the world of social science, we can see that it's a concept that has existed for a long time. Um, there is a fantastic book from Mark Steinberg at Concordia who gives a genealogy of the concept of platform to the automotive industry 
in Japan in the 80s. So we're talking about something that is not really digital to start with, but that has a long history um, already. The concept came closer to the digital world through the world of management scholars who talked about um, platform leadership, for example, early in the 2000s. But obviously, it is what came to be known as the Web 2.0 in industry term that put platform to the spotlight. So what are the typical properties that we attach to a platform? It is an intermediary. It is something that exists to link two sides or multiple sides um, in order to shape, reshape practices, trade, transactions, creativity, and so on and so forth. If we look more at these concepts through a managerial perspective, we would look at related concepts such as um, two or n-sided markets. This is basically what Uber is. This is a platform that brings together drivers and um, users. So it's a two-sided market. It can be more than that. So this is a transaction platform. We can also define platform as a innovation platform. I'm using this dichotomy from Annabel Gower and authors um, in her recent book about platform leadership. And a innovation platform is a platform that aims to support creativity. We know that in our everyday life, uh, for example, an Apple store fits this principle. An Apple store is a set of constraints, software development kit, operating systems that third-party developers use to create an application um, that they will then deposit, submit to an app store, and that will be distributed. So... These are the type of configurations that we attach to um, to platform. But to summarize and closer maybe to the world of communications, we emphasize the idea of an intermediary that is shaping yeah, practices, communication, uh, the distribution of information. That's the basic architecture of a platform. Right. And then going more towards the infrastructural side, I think it's interesting because infrastructures can refer to digital technologies, but they can also refer to things like public utilities or supply lines, right? Yeah. So what are the core characteristics of an infrastructure? It's ah, That's a really fascinating question. It's always something that is I'm, I'm grappling with and talking with students about that. It's always the idea, oh, we, we first think of infrastructure through its sheer materiality, right? Typically, when we have this idea, this concept in this, this name, what comes to mind are bridges or large-scale distributed services, these type of things. If we look at infrastructure less as an object, but more as a concept, then we see different things. We look at technology through the lens of what came to be known as infrastructure studies, then we see specific type of things. This is a body of work that would emphasize not just the brick and mortar nature of infrastructure, but the idea of a technology as distributed system is a fundamental idea of infrastructure. I'm thinking of the work of Susan Lee Starr, for example, or Jeff Bakker. A technology, as soon as it is distributed, as long as it links the local and the global, as soon as it becomes embedded within uh, communities of practices, as soon as it becomes important point indispensable, then the technology can be designated as um, infrastructure. It's a very social studies of technology take applied to infrastructure, emphasizing, to summarize, um, the scale of a technology, the indispensability, how it links to existing networks and system through um, gateway. So a different set of properties attached to that. Right. It's, it's a different set of properties attached to you know what we might think of Facebook or Google, but it doesn't take away from all the characteristics you were talking about with platforms, mm -hmm. right? All the so the managerial side or the creativity side. Um, and so this is where things start to get, you know, I think really interesting is that um, as you and colleagues have argued, these platforms or these companies or these tech giants, however we want to call them, they exhibit increasing uh, blended characteristics of both such that, that there's a 
infrastructuralization of platforms and the platformization of infrastructure. So do you want to recap that argument for us and kind of talk about, let's say, um, I don't know, which one would you like to take first? Uh, <laughs> I, either or, but, yeah, and again, this is really like not the most gracious term that exists in the world. But what we wanted to do is really try to reflect this, this blending over and this mutual form of um, reciprocity, let's say. Let's start with a platform that is becoming infrastructural to try to put it in, in, a, in a more elegant way. Something I've worked on for a long time is participatory maps or digital maps, let's say. And if we look at the model of Google Maps, I think it is a telling example. Um, Google Maps, when it was created in early 2000s, exhibited all the properties that we associate with a platform that we mentioned already. Um, instead of having access to a map through a software like a GIS, Google Maps was online very quickly Google released an API that allowed not anybody but people with the skills and computing power to embed a map on its website or create an application, create a mashup, as it was um, described by it. So very much this participatory media type of flavor. However, when we look at Google Maps now, which is close to 20 years after it was created, we can see that it has become indispensable to a lot of different services or administration who use this service. It exists and it has a refined quality as a service by linking uh, different sources of data, either public survey data, for example, or other internal um, data capture from Google, uh, linking different type of uh, infrastructure together in order to improve constantly its services, and so on and so forth. It has reached a scale that is really important. So what is interesting, to get back to, to the tension you were emphasizing earlier, is that it's not really a matter of, of trying to say, is Google Map a platform or an infrastructure? What is more interesting is is rephrasing the question as such. When does it make sense to look at Google Maps through the lens of platform studies, through these body of work? When does it make sense to take the concept from infrastructure to look at the same object? When does that make sense to have these two perspectives cohabited? Mm. I think when I think about the the infrastructuralization of platforms, again, maybe not the most elegant term, but but this idea of more the the ways that these platforms are actually sort of making material changes mm -hmm. in, in the infrastructural world. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at Google Maps, um, that requires a massive you know, amount of servers and the real kind of material things that give that platform a chance to operate. I mean, we look at things like Bitcoin. They need a huge amount of servers and uh, electric power to actually have this thing functioning. I mean... That's also an aspect, and I know we'll get into this a bit later, but that's also an important aspect that I think people sort of don't think about in platform studies is that these companies are creating these massive changes in how the underlying tech infrastructure that we all use works. And I just wonder, how do you view that as you know different or complementary to the actual services like uh, you know? Twitter launching fleets, <laughs> you know, these like stories is one thing, but then there's also like, what are some of these tech giants doing that's sort of changing the infrastructural industry as well? Yeah, I mean, this is really at the center of my current work, but maybe just before we got it to that, uh, maybe to illustrate the the power of this platform model, we could we could start by looking at how these tech giants are becoming indispensable. Okay, this is one point. Um, Google Maps is a sort of de facto standards for online mapping. It is just a highly successful platform that becomes infrastructure. Okay, that's fine. We can also look at how, by being extremely successful, these entities promote a model, a platform logic that then circulates across the social world and can be taken by existing institution as a new MO for their action. And that's what I would call more as a, it's a deeper transformation. To 
Stay on the example of cartography. What is interesting to see is how existing institutions, for example, Ordnance Survey in the UK or the Geographic Survey Institute in the US or IGN um, in France, these institutions, this information system realize that Google Maps is extremely powerful and provide a model that is doing very well. So these existing institutions, while remaining what they are, include more platform-based mode of dissemination of their data. They would release APIs, for example. They would engage in open data. They would try to create an ecosystem of applications, which is exactly the platform model, but apply to their own existing infrastructural function. So it's a more subtle, let's say, way of transforming the way a service is provided. Right. Well, I know Google Maps transforms my way of eating uh, by virtue yeah. of their restaurant reviews. Um, but I, I want to ask you specifically on this point about WeChat in a second, because I know you've done some research on WeChat. But I have another question about looking at political communication or the politics of platforms. And I think what a lot of political communication scholars do and what a lot of listeners to this podcast are interested in or do as their career is to look at you know, what is the uh, discussion around this hashtag or this election? What are politicians posting? And this is all kind of within the platform activity. And yet, as you're saying, these tech giants have become to be so important by virtue of being you know, these powerful platforms and also uh, infrastructures that I wonder by focusing so much on the politics happening within a platform, are we missing some type of larger... I don't know, geopolitical understanding of politics or some, you know, societal transformations by just focusing on those digital communications within platforms. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what is really fascinating is how because we're talking about companies, tech companies that now operate at multiple level, let's say to make it very simple, we have a more user facing uh, interface level, and then we have a more a deeper down infrastructural level with all the computing capacity, the storage, and this type of thing. Now, what we see is that because we're talking about companies that exist at the multiple stages of the stack, the social debates, the social question that we see at the interface level can also exist be replicated at the infrastructural level. The best example we can see is how we're all familiar with the debates about the moderation of hate speech um, online and all the, the nightmare that it is for this company to find a proper way to deal with that problem. Strong problem and regulation come into force. And it's really, we, we know all this problem at the interface level. More and more, we see how similar debates around moderation are applied at the infrastructural level. A example would be, should a cloud provider, such as Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, step in when it is hosting a website that disseminates fake news or hate speech. There has been a few examples in the past, and some of these actors, more um, background computing actors, so to speak, having to face this decision, the same decision that Twitter and Facebook have to decide about the content, uh, cloud provider start to ask that question at the hosting level. So there is a sort of a replication of these debates that you were mentioning deeper down, which is really fascinating. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the, the most recent example that I can think of would be um, Amazon Web Services mm -hmm. pulling Parler off their exactly. uh, server for a while. Um, and all of a sudden, everyone was like, what is, what is AWS? What, you know, where do they come into the, to the picture, which is interesting. Um, well, let's, let's move uh, a little bit towards Chinese platforms uh, and WeChat in particular. And um, you've written a paper um, looking at the infrastructuralization of WeChat uh, as a platform. And maybe before we get into that, because you argue in that paper that from a platform lens, as we've been talking about, uh, WeChat followed the same trajectory as a Western platform like, like Facebook. And so I'm just curious if you could kind of recap how, like what is a, 
standard platform trajectory look like? And how has WeChat kind of followed a similar development from the platform side? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this is the result of a work I conducted with my colleague, Gabriel De Seta. And our starting point was that we were, we were reading the same literature about yeah, platforms and infrastructure and this type of thing. And we were kind of getting annoyed, obviously, of just talking about Facebook and Google all the time. So we were like, okay, let's try to see how it's, how it's happening in other parts of the world. Gabrielle being a, an expert in the Chinese internet, then we decided to, to focus on um, WeChat, which was and still is one of the most um, successful application, let's say, um, to use a more, a more generic term. And what we find really surprising and exciting by studying the recent history of WeChat is how since the beginning, it's really purported to become a, a full encompassing uh, application. And this is the thing that is picked up mostly by tech journalists and others. What is fascinating about WeChat is that it's not just an application, it is a suite of application. It is a whole ecosystem of its own. It is an ecosystem that has in itself all these nested apps, um, meaning that you can do everything you want. You don't have to leave the application, basically, which is something that was architecturally designed since the beginning. Um, and this is a contrast with the growth of large companies that, for example, if we look at Facebook, which typically grow, yes, by internal development, but most drastically by acquisition of other companies to then include them in its portfolio. It is somehow the biggest difference that we could see. The other interesting thing about WeChat is that when we replace WeChat in the context of the informatization, digitalization of Chinese society, we see that in the 90s, the government decided to set up large five-year plans to digitize its administration and economy. They were called the Golden Shields Project. These projects, um, one that included the, what came to be known as the firewall, the Great Firewall, to control communications from outside, in and outside. Um, these projects, uh, this series of projects, were not that successful, or at least that's how they came to be studied, for many, many reasons, but one main reason being usually presented as the heavy uh, dimension of the administrative bureaucratic system that um, the economy was involving. However, Applications such as WeChat or other tech national champions in China came to take over and fulfill this goal of providing a large-scale, very efficient digitization of services. And we see that very drastically these days when we can just think of um, digital payment, digital currency. If you are in China and if you don't have an Alipay or a WeChat Pay account, uh, which was my case when I went to China, you, you feel really left out because <laughs> this is really, it has become a really everyday, almost only mode of, um, of payment, at least in big urban centers. So it really is telling in, um, in the way that it can, it can become embedded quickly in everyday practice, let's say. Right. And I, I think you start the paper uh, with an anecdote from someone who's uh, recounting an experience of where they lost their phone in, in Shanghai and, and they were really paralyzed because, mm -hmm. I mean, if we lose our phones, uh, you know, it's, it's terrible. We can't, uh, you know, do certain things <laughs> like communicate with people, call with people, log into our bank accounts, whatever. But it really, that anecdote shows that in China, if you lose your phone and particularly if you lose WeChat, you're, you're really locked out in terms of being able to pay for things because it's such a, a key part of the uh, the society there. Absolutely, yeah. But, you know, it, it, it's, it wasn't, as I understand it, WeChat, um, it wasn't developed necessarily like from the, you know, top down. It still had these um, 
these APIs that allowed third-party developers to program the the apps within within the service. So it, it still has that similar aspect from the platform side of like creativity and you know third-party applications. Um, but you argue in the paper that um, WeChat's development illustrates a, a Chinese model of platform infrastructureization. I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on what is that Chinese model and how might it differ from what we see in the West. Yeah, and this is something that I feel it will be my collaborator to to take over that question because he's more the the expert on that question. But um, yes, WeChat is first and foremost a platform, and in that regards, it does have software development kits, and it relies on third party developers to bring new apps to feed this ecosystem with apps and um, and different things like that. Um, what architecturally we found interesting was how even though it is open to third-party developers and others it is much more constraining for developers than um, it would be for other applications especially in terms of the code the language that needs to be used uh, to develop application to run through wechat it's a specific language that is different that you have to learn and implement as we mentioned earlier the applications that you develop leave within the ecosystem it's a more of a nested app they were at least in 2019 the time we wrote that paper, um, restrictions in terms of links, hyperlinks that you can embed inside your application that would bring you out of the ecosystem. So architecturally speaking, um, we found that WeChat was much more of a walled garden, let's say, than other application. It is a nested app. Everything is well tucked in in there. And it's really designed for you to stay inside the um the application um i would have a hard time extrapolating to find a chinese model specifically beyond that because we really focused on wechat wechat has evolved since then and there are other applications other yeah famous suite of applications that we know um, other people have done that much better than i could do i'm thinking of yu hong for example at Zhejiang university who has been studying generally how the governance Chinese model of platform governance came to be what it is and how it is applied these days. Yeah, but I, I think the the key point is that it has this this kind of platform logic or, or whatever you'd like to call it this this way of development and improving the service, but it is much more constrained, which I think kind of logically makes sense if you think about the different social and, and political structures that it's embedded. Um, but let's switch gears a bit to your your current research, which I find super fascinating, because now we're really getting into, as you said, the the materiality of these infrastructures and and the the, the thinking behind it that's becoming more platformized, maybe. If, I don't know if you would put it that way. But um, you have this idea of programmable infrastructures, um, which is really looking at these hardwares, like servers, switches, fiber optics, um, and how they're becoming more programmable. So could you kind of outline that concept for us and kind of how you're going about studying it? Of course. Um, so, so far, we've used the term infrastructure as a concept, um, and we have used infrastructure to emphasize some properties such as relationality, criticality, uh, scale of use, and so on and so forth. But what I came to realize as I was reading more and more about Tech Giant and how they develop their activity is that there is actually a very literal sense, meaning of infrastructure that is becoming more and more important, i.e. the material basis, the computing the networking that these companies have been developing and uh, unfolding at quite a, a fast pace and a very large scale. I feel there's been more and more press coverage about them. We've been hearing more and more about them. So it's not completely invisible. Um, some of you might have read about the large transatlantic subsea cables that Microsoft or Amazon are setting. You might have read some articles about the mega data centers that these companies um, have put forward. So there is more effort and investment from this company in expanding their infrastructural capacity, which is not that surprising, to be honest, because they are very large 
companies uh, and they have a distributed activity all over the world. So they need to have the capacity to sustain this activity, so to speak. Um, all our links are likes, but more and more the very heavy materials that we upload or stream. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing is that most of these tech giants are also cloud providers. So the cloud is basically hosting other people's data. So they need to have these um, large scale capacity to do that. So again, this aspect is not that surprising. It makes sense that this company need a lot of um, computing storage uh, infrastructure. What I found more interesting by studying this aspect of their activity is how these companies are not just investing in their own infrastructure. They are not just spending tons of money on beefing up their infrastructure. They are also changing the model for running these infrastructure. They are pushing for new forms of building and managing this infrastructure. That's where it's becoming more subtle and yet more interesting. The model that they put forward, that they push for, is, as you mentioned, model that I describe as programmable infrastructure. Programmable really in the, in the computing sense, the idea that you take something that is uh, static, but you program it to have a specific um, outcome, which is also one of the main property of this platform model that we mentioned earlier. The difference between just a static website and a platform is that in a platform, you give access to a database via application programming interface, for example, to develop something more, something extra that will live um, on top of it. It is this paradigm of programmability that is applied to the way they manage their infrastructure. And this is the model that they push for. To summarize and to put it into a formula that I like to use is these tech giants are managing their infrastructure just like they manage their platform. They use the same model but at the level of the infrastructure, which is not surprising because the platform model is the reason why they are so successful and why they became these giants in the first place. So they are, to some extent, repurposing the same recipe, the same platform recipe at the level of their infrastructure. Yeah. And you go you know, much more in depth uh, in this, in your lecture, that the uh... Listeners can go and check out in the episode description. But I think a really powerful example of this that you mentioned in that talk is, is one of the earlier examples. And obviously now it's become much more complex. But I think for listeners to really grasp this idea, um, maybe you could give the example of how Google approached its servers, because I think that is a, an early stage of how the thinking behind programming goes into infrastructures. Yeah, absolutely. What really set the tone for how Google dealt with its computing, i.e. really its, uh, its storage capacity, the, the hardware and other computing devices it needed to run its search engine at the beginning. Um, what really set them apart was the sheer neglect that they had toward it, which can be paradoxical, but it's been documented by reporters such as Stephen Levy, who writes very often for Wired and wrote a book uh, called In the Plex, uh, and many other accounts of uh, the early days of Google's. Um, you can see that instead of going the normal route, which typically for a, a startup, for a tech company generally, will be to contract. It, we're in the late 90s. That was before the cloud. Would contract with HP or IBM and buy these um, large racks, these server cabinets filled with different components all put together, typically with a lot of proprietary firmware um, and hardware. What they did is that they, from the scratch, decided to just buy hundreds and hundreds of hardware. But the one that you buy at the store, really, like a hard drive that you can just buy at any store and connect them all together in a, in, a, in a naked way, not in a, a very pretty server rack. So 
they bought these different things, they put them all together, they chose the language, and they, they did the magic themselves. The idea was just like, instead of buying a ready-made product, um, a server rack that would have a lot of things that we don't necessarily want to, why not using disaggregated components, i.e. you buy the storage capacity on one hand, you buy the switch, the cable, and so on in other places, you put them all together and you have more flexibility. You can just change one part not and not having to change the other one. So it is presented as a sort of way of freeing themselves from existing supplier and the constraint that come with these black boxes that they that so that was for the early days. Yeah, I mean I think it's 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 similar. I have, I have a few friends who they they like to build their own gaming computers because you can buy the different parts for cheaper and then put them together and not have to pay the big box price of how you'd buy it pre-assembled. And so I think these um these companies as as you note in your research they're 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 kind of doing a similar thing but then they also have to program code to get those different components working together because this hasn't been done before. And so they're they're doing a lot of this um open source which they uh sort of kind of come together as an industry, as far as I understand it. And they have this open compute project where they have, you know, uh, set up verification procedures for what should be allowed to be part of these infrastructures. And so I'm wondering, I mean, if you take the gaming computer example, I think, or the Google example, it might be that these disaggregated components, putting them together might be more efficient. But does it have any type of concerns around... Um, either challenging existing, you know, telecom companies, or are there any, you know, privacy risks or security risks that come with that? Or, or what are the sort of implications of this sort of new model of infrastructures? Yeah, absolutely. And disaggregation is just one stage of that, of that model. First, the, the way these tech giants operate is that, well, they, they want to bypass existing suppliers, basically. So instead, they rely on these uh, separate disaggregated hardware and software. But then the next step could be um, going directly to the suppliers and asking for specific custom-made equipment that cutting the middleman, so to speak, going directly to the source and getting exactly the type of gear that they want. Um, it takes the form then of finding the way of integrating all these different components with hard custom hardware and software, typically open source, and pushing for more software-driven processes. Um, all these different components, uh, I don't know, in the data center that can be, yeah, the servers or the networking devices such as switches, um, are very hardware-based, i.e. a lot of function are still present at the equipment level. What the existing trend that these companies push for is to put many more functions in the cloud and manage them through software. So these are all the different stages that all together populate this model that I would call programmable infrastructure. Now, we are talking about existing industry trends, um, putting more functions through software and managing them at distance. It existed before in what called in the industry virtualization. Um, disaggregation of components, it has existed also for a while. There's been attempt to that in the telecom industry, in the telecom space uh, in the 80s, 90s uh, already. And open source obviously existed much before. So I want to make clear that these tech giants didn't invent everything in this, in this way of networking. However, what they do is they really find existing trends in the networking industry. And they put a lot of money and a lot of developers on them. And because of this sheer force, they they manage to drive the industry one way instead of the other. So it's a it's quite a powerful position um, to be in. Specifically about if I can build up a little bit on what you said about open. Yeah, a project I've been following specifically is called the Open Compute Project. It is an industry consortium created in 2011 by Facebook and other industry actors. It's really not just Facebook, but they're the one who impulsed it, um, let's say, which aims to push for the open source model 
in the networking industry. The big enemy there is we are in the, in the data center industry. So it's less, it's less the telecom world here, but it's more existing suppliers, the IBMs and the HPs um, of the world that have been having the monopoly for, um, for networking, storage, compute equipment for a very long time. It is all the series of constraints that typically come with contracting with them that these tech giants have been wanting to bypass. These constraints that we mentioned earlier, such as lots of proprietary, bundled, expensive hardware, it's been annoying everybody for a very long time. It's really not just these guys. Uh, and telecom operators have been really complaining for a long time over their dependence toward their supplier. However, tech giants, Facebook, Amazon, and other been the first one to really try to change the industry by providing an alternative model, by pushing for an open model to shake things up and really redistribute the power relations within this industry, which is something we typically don't hear about. Um, like most of us have no idea that Facebook or Google are, are that involved in equipment design or integration or use up to the point of trying to change how the how the industry is going forward. So it's a pretty it's a pretty powerful position to to be in. Yeah, exactly. And so my last question for you, um, I'm going to connect it to to meme stocks and the whole recent phenomenon around GameStop and uh, all these, you know, Reddit traders um, pushing up the prices of stocks. Mm -hmm. And some things I was reading about this were, okay, if this is GameStop, right, a video game retailer, okay, so what if the price goes, you know, 2000%. Um, but if it happens to a company like Nokia, which was one of these um, meme stocks, then it becomes worrisome because you're playing with the market cap of companies that deal with cloud services and, and 5G networks and things like that. So I'm wondering, you know, from a consumer perspective, um, is this type of programmable infrastructure simply a benefit for us as consumers that we get cheaper services and more efficient uh, computing? Or are there larger concerns that we should be worried about? Or what might be the, the impact? As you said, these companies are getting more powerful through their changing the industry trends that we've seen before. But you know, should we be concerned about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're right that we are talking about very industry concerns here and this is really unless unless you go to these events and you look at what's happening it's hard to see why why should we care about this and to some extent these transformation allow these tech companies to have better services if you have a network of data centers from google that are linked by um super powerful subsea cables and things like that you you have the probability that your email will be down or that videos on YouTube are going to be down decreases. So to some extent, this is it can be seen as a good thing in terms of service provision. However, if we take a step aside and look at what's going on, we see a few things. We see that the most efficient networks are closed networks. All the different things that we mention are made to build a closed networks of, let's say, uh, Facebook data centers linked by subsea cables and constant improvement of the traffic between these data centers. So we see the multiplication of siloed networks that are really extremely efficient, but that are cut from the public internet. So, I mean, the public internet is a network of networks, so it's not taking over anything. It's just cohabitating with a multiplicity of network. But when we think of, wait, we could all benefit from having a better, more efficient internet, right? But these innovation is only going to one side of the industry, some specific actors instead of others. So that's one, that's one concern that we can, we can have. Another concerns are basic security concerns, something a, 
we haven't talked about telecom operators so much, but um, a trend right now in the telecom space is a project called Open RAN. RAN is the radio access network, um, which is the the part of the network that is the closest from us. This is the radio antenna, the mast that we see sometime in the street, plus the different network equipment, uh, data processing equipment related to that antenna. So that's the radio access network. Same problem, this piece of equipment is controlled by three suppliers um, who share 80% of the market, that's Huawei, Nokia, and Ericsson. And telecom operators, became fed up, more increasingly fed up of having to, well, uh, put a, give a lot of money to these um, suppliers for a product that might not necessarily fit uh, their need. 5G coming, everybody knows they're going to have to put much more money in this antenna. So that was the moment where they decided to move and try to push for another model. Hence, this model called Open RAN that came to to be designed in um, this other consortium called Telecom Infra Project, which is very close to this open compute project that we mentioned earlier, which in the sense that it is also imposed by Facebook and it's also pushing for the open source, but yet applied to the telecom world. The reason I'm mentioning that is that Open RAN now is extremely discussed and debated in terms of security. I'm not mentioning the Huawei debate, it's a thing on its own, but putting such a critical piece of equipment, um, disaggregating it again, and uh, having different supplier putting different pieces, deciding uh, which integration interface to put in there, maybe it's open source, maybe the specs are open. From a cybersecurity perspective, it brings a lot of question, it increases the surface of potential risk. So just that in and of itself is a, is a security concern. The last point that I'm going to mention very quickly is that through this type of innovation, either large infrastructural um, expansion or having all these different, this multiplication of this radio access network, what we see is just a general extension of datafication of data extraction capacities uh, in the hands of uh, a little set of actors. Absolutely. And I think when we take this, you know, other look at infrastructures and think about platforms more broadly, as we did earlier in the episode, it really, for me, it, it starts to make my head spin a bit, but it, it, it also points to the idea or the issue that we're discussing as a research community, but as society generally is not just about, you know, What's Facebook doing, or you know, did they catch these, you know, fake accounts? Like, it's really a massive, massive issue, and I think that's what your research spotlights. So, Dr. Planton, thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your research with us. Absolutely, that was a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Michael. I've just been speaking with Dr. Jean Christophe Planton, associate professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time, we'll have Tom Moylan on the show, an EU communications specialist, to talk about how the European Commission uses social media, how it's developed over time, and similarities and differences between social media communication and speech writing for political leaders. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Malna. See you next time.